I believe now we are live, so I just want to welcome all of you to the start of this year's Iran Club. It is really just such a thrill and honor and excite, exciting to introduce um, you all to the speaker series we have lined. My name is director of the Yale Program in Iranian Studies, and this semester uh, we have been, well, we have planned an exciting series of talks for the for uh, for all of you, and um, so I'm I'm just very thrilled to be here and to to welcome you, be it albeit virtually. Before we begin, I would first like to thank Dr. Majan uh, Wardaki, the postdoctoral research fellow in the program of Iranian Studies and in the Council of Middle East Studies. She's done an absolutely fantastic job helping to coordinate and organize this year, year series that we have planned for the year. I also want to give a shout out to Marwa Kabor, the program coordinator for the Macmillan Center's Council on truly the back of all the activities that we organize and put together. Before I introduce Dr. Daniel Sheffield, I should say uh, that this is a webinar. Uh, and so uh, we, he will be visible to you, but you will not be visible to us, as it were. Um, the talk, that said, we do want to have your input and feedback and questions. Uh, his talk will run for about 40, 45 minutes, and you will be able to put any questions or comments that you have in the Q&A section that's uh, listed here right in the Zoom screen. Uh, so that uh, with, with that, I just wanted to now... I'll turn to a, a brief introduction, uh, a could very long uh, introduction to Daniel Sheffield, Professor Daniel Sheffield, uh, who is at the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton. I long because of just the religious and uh, truly formidable fields that he covers uh, and the kinds of skills uh, across just a host of languages that are truly dizzying, dizzying and encyclopedic. Uh, he is above all a specialist in the social and intellectual history of Zoroastrians during the late and early modern periods. He works particularly on the transmission and transformation of ideas from late antiquity into early modernity. And in that sense, he really is able to cover millennia of ideas and their transformation and continuity and change over just such a broad swath of history, time and place. Professor Sheffield is the author of numerous articles and two forthcoming books. The first, the um, Vazir Kar de Denig, the Pahlavi Book of Religious Decrees, which is uh, coming out this next year. Uh, and then his second book, also forthcoming, Cosmopolitan Zarathustra's Translating Religion in Iran and India. Uh, it tells the story of Zoroastrian communities across uh, Iran and South Asia uh, and tracing the development of cosmopolitan theological vocabularies. Uh, moreover, Professor Sheffield is currently working on a third book project, revisiting the life and afterlives of uh, Azar, the Azar Kevan movement in the 16th and 17th centuries, which uh, circulates in and outside of uh, India, and it culminates in the production of the very well-known uh, Dabistan and Mazahib, the School of Doctrines. I have known uh, Dan, Professor Sheffield, for many, many years. Uh, he is just not only uh, formidable and prodigious in the kinds of areas that he can cover, uh, but he's also just truly a wonderful person. And, and, and it is such an honor and privilege to, to welcome him here to start the new year uh, and the speaker series. So without further ado, I will turn it. OK, uh, thank you so much, uh, Travis, for that uh, really uh, undeserved uh, introduction. It's uh, so exciting uh, to be here at Yale with so many friends. It's it's just astonishing to see the number of people who have uh, signed on to this this call uh, from around the world. Uh, and so, though there have been many dark spots in the last uh, eighteen months, um, one of the uh, the real uh, pleasures is being able to get together um, in these venues uh, with all of you. Uh, I've known Travis now, Professor Zade, for I think, I was thinking 17 years or something along those lines. I think I met you first in 2004. Uh, so it's such a pleasure to be here uh, together with really a fellow traveler um, in my own development as a scholar. Um, uh, it's also a pleasure uh, to be uh, here with uh, Dr. Mahajan Wardeki, uh, who I've known for many years and who uh, reached out to me to invite me to give this lecture. Uh, to the Iran Colloquium. Thank you, Marjan. Yale is very lucky to have you. And I really look forward to the, the series that you've organized for this semester. It's such a pleasure to be able to participate uh, even from down the coast here in Princeton. Finally, thank you to Marah Kabur uh, for smoothing out all of the technical um, details of, of delivering this lecture and of bringing all of us uh, together uh, here 
So without any further ado, I'll, I'll share my screen um, and uh, I'll get going. Okay, should be able to see my slides now. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you uh, about a project that is related to my, I suppose, third book, uh, which Professor Zade was just uh, mentioning, uh, a book uh, about the uh, sort of prehistory, the life, and the afterlife of an encyclopedia of, of comparative religion and the history of religions written in 17th century India called the Dabistan and Mazaheb for the School of Doctrines. Uh, a text uh, which is really a remarkable um, exploration of, of the religious world of early modern Muslim India, as it was known uh, to its author who wrote this text in 1650 in the vicinity of Hyderabad. Uh, and for anyone who's, who's read that text, uh, they would know that there is a, a very fascinating and indeed somewhat strange presentation uh, of, of the histories of the religions of Iran. Um, which is what leads me to uh, today's presentation. I'll, I'll be talking about a text that has fascinated me for a long time. A text called the Dasatire Asamani, the book of the celestial laws or celestial regulations. It's an obscure text, admittedly, or at least it seems so at first glance, but I believe it's a text which has had an enormous impact on the shape of the field of Iranian studies, and in particular, the history of thought in Iranian civilization. Now, this is some, somewhat of a problematic category, but one that we'll, uh, we'll get to at the end of, of today's talk. To illustrate this text, first of all, and its sort of you know, impact that it might have on, on first uh, being exposed to it, the feelings of loss and recovery that it embodies, uh, I'd like to begin with, with an anecdote, an anecdote um, that is mentioned uh, in Afshin Madashi's recent book, Exile in the Nation. I believe Professor Madashi uh, spoke uh, in this series uh, about a year ago, actually, about his book. Uh, and so I think this is a nice segue um, into the text. As a young man, the Iranian scholar, antiquarian, uh, nationalist, and, and ultimately Iranologist, study, uh, the student of uh, ancient Iranian languages and literatures, Ibrahim Purdaud. Uh, was studying uh, in Beirut. The story begins uh, when the young poet, Pur Daoud, studying far away from home, um, is, uh, is uh, in a, a meeting with uh, one of his friends uh, and a fellow Iranian resident in the city. Like many of his generation, Pur Daoud was strongly influenced by the events leading up to the Constitutional Revolution of 1906-1907. Strongly nationalist um, uh, um, in sentiment, Pur Daoud was, was fascinated by Iran's antiquity and by the classics of Persian literature. He writes uh, in something of a memoir of his time in Beirut, um, uh, which he prefaces to a study of, of the Dasat here. 33 years ago, 1907, when I was a student in Beirut, an Iranian friend, now a famous doctor in Tehran, who knew that I was interested in old Persian words and curious about ancient stories, gave me a book in which I could find what I wanted. That book, which up until that day I had never heard of, was the Dasotir. In those days, at the beginning of my youth, my memory was not bad. I memorized what I read. I considered myself lucky to be the fortuitous recipient of a divine gift, since I felt that I had discovered what I had been seeking. The Dasotire Osamoni freed me from the need of using many foreign words. Now, for any of you who have encountered this text, uh, you might know that the Dasotir claims to be uh, a, a recording of the words of God as narrated to a series of, of 16 ancient Iranian prophet kings, uh, recorded first in the language of heaven, that is the language of God and the angels itself. Uh, and then uh, all of these uh, various texts which were delivered to the 16 prophet kings were given a translation into pure Persian, that is Persian with no Arabic words uh, by, according to the text, someone called Sasan V, Sasan Epanjom uh, in Persian, 
that is uh, a descendant uh, of, of um, a man who lived in the time of Alexander, Sasan the first, Alexander the Great, uh, who ultimately uh, gave his name to the Sasanian dynasty, which ruled over Iran uh, immediately prior to the coming of Islam. Pur Daoud was interested in the Dasatir primarily because it, the words in the Dasatir, the pure Persian words that he found there, seemingly allowed him to compose poetry in Persian without the necessity of using any Arabic words. Uh, and the way that he did this was to use the Dasatiri sort of neologisms, uh, that is words uh, supposedly of ancient Persian origin, uh, which could substitute uh, for common words in Arabic. So um, uh, here is a poem uh, that uh, Pur Daoud wrote during his youth, uh, which is entitled, Another Ode Describing Persian. And so immediately to the Persian speakers in the audience, the usage of the word foruze might seem a bit odd. Right? Foruze seems to mean maybe, I mean, it would, would seem to be related to the verb, you know, foruchtan, or sorry, afruchtan rather, to illuminate. Um, and uh, so it would seem to mean something related to illumination, uh, but uh, Pur Daoud understood the word to mean sefat or description. Let's read a few lines of the poem uh, and get to a couple of the curious words he used in it. Zabone ironemost porsi boston, one neogonemost porsi boston, bar zabare keshvere obado jam shiro ke, chohure rokshon, chohure rokshonemost porsi boston, sazar gar ironion veros etoyesh conand, nule yazdonemost porsi boston. I won't read the whole thing. Our Iran language is ancient Persian. Our forebear's tongue is ancient Persian. Above the land of Qobad, Jamshid, and the Kays, our shining sun is ancient Persian. It is fitting if the Iranians praise it, our God's speech. Here he uses a strange word, nule, uh, to, for speech uh, is ancient Persian. Pordo would understood the word nule, which he borrowed also from the Dasatir, to mean kalom in Arabic, meaning the, the speech, uh, speech, specifically the speech of God. Um, and so on. Pur Dawood goes on to describe in his memoirs uh, an encounter with the great Iranian scholar now in Paris, Mohammad Qazvini, uh, a slightly older uh, student now, uh, now in Europe. Uh, Pur Dawood uh, meets Qazvini and ultimately decides to show him some of his poetry. He writes, in Paris, I became acquainted with and gradually befriended that great scholar, Mohammad Qazvini, who is, now in, uh, who is now also in Tehran. In our conversations, I would occasionally show him what I had amassed in Beirut. One day he said, these wouldn't happen to be Mola Firuzi words, would they? Asking specifically about words like foruze, nule, and so on. I said, yes, they're from the Dasotire Osmani of the Iranian prophets, which Mola Firuz published. Qazvini said, the language and contents of this book are both the forgeries of some earlier nobody. These words fell heavily upon me. Just like that, I saw my treasure vanish before my eyes. So here in, in Pur Daoud's description, we see a narrative first of enchantment with a, a seemingly ancient text, uh, which holds the possibility of, of, of removing Arabic influence uh, in one's language and tapping into a pure Persian essence. Uh, and then ultimately a, a disenchantment, a disappointment when he learns uh, that the Dasatir that he's held in such high regard can be used as something of a cornerstone in his own poetry uh, is regarded now uh, by the scholarly establishment uh, as a forgery. Indeed, poor Daoud was not the only uh, uh, scholar uh, over the centuries uh, to have been taken in by the alluring appeal of the Dasotir. More than a century earlier, William Jones, writing at the beginning of a new phase of the study of comparative philology and religion in the Anglo-colonial world, presented his reading of the Persian language encyclopedia of religions, Dabistan and Mazaheb, as follows. The primeval religion of Iran, if we rely on the authority adduced by Mohsen Efani, the author that he thought had written the Dabistan, was that which Isaac Newton calls the oldest, and it may justly be called the noblest of all religions. 
the first monarch of Iran and of the whole earth was Mahabad, who received from the creator and promulgated among men a sacred book in a heavenly language, Dasatir, or regulations. Here, though Jones had never seen uh, the, the Dasatir, uh, the promise of a text uh, which seemed to uh, tap into the oldest extant religious thought of humanity uh, created quite a uh, tumult uh, in the scholarly world to, to try to track down um, this text of the Dasatir. So happened that the text uh, was extant. Uh, today we know that there are a number of copies, uh, manuscript copies uh, of the Dasatir which survive from the 17th century and later periods. Um, but at the beginning of the 19th century, the first copy of the text to be known belonged to the man in the center of this slide, uh, usually known as Mullah Firuz, or Peshtun, son of Kavus, uh, who was the high priest of the Parsis of Bombay at the beginning of the 19th century. Mullah Firuz had obtained a manuscript of the Dasatir together with his father uh, when he was uh, living in Iran uh, under the reign of Karim Khan, the Zand, uh, during the mid 18th century. Uh, and um, uh, upon learning of the British colonial powers interest uh, in obtaining a copy of this text, Firuz brought his manuscript uh, to the governor of Bombay, the man on the left of this slide, Jonathan Duncan, uh, who immediately uh, became very excited at seeing the text which Jones had described as containing the oldest religion of mankind uh, and, and set about uh, translating the work and publishing it in Persian. You can see the translation um, uh, as it uh, was printed in Bombay uh, in 1818 on the right uh, of, of this slide. However, immediately upon the publication of the text in 1818, it was attacked first in the Indian press and later by, uh, by scholars around the world. It was clear that the language was not what Jones had first, what Jones had first described as the Indo-European uh, language, rather uh, in uh, the words of uh, one of its uh, detractors, uh, it was quote, an amusing specimen of genuine uh, gibberish or in the words of a, uh, of a more uh, recent detractor, uh, the, namely the editor of the Encyclopedia Ironica, presumably Esan Yorshater. Its text consists of unintelligible gibberish and the so-called commentary is an infected uh, pure Persian uh, devoid of, of any Arabic words. Uh, okay, now we'll return to uh, the various histories that this text takes on in the 19th and 20th centuries. Needless to say, it was not uh, you know, unilaterally uh, sort of dismissed out of hand after um, these uh, criticisms of the text. Uh, but, but I want to um, uh, uh, take a step back. Um, since uh, the Dasautier was shown right away in the 19th century, uh, likely not to possess great antiquity, uh, very few have attempted to study the text uh, in any sort of historical context or indeed uh, to try to give any account of why a text uh, purporting uh, to stretch back uh, into um, you know, earliest prehistory, indeed far greater prehistory than, than normally um, Iranians uh, uh, assume to have into what, what we might call pre-Adamite history, the time before Adam, um, and why, why such a text was composed, what it might be composed of, uh, and why and how it began to circulate in the 10th, 11th Islamic centuries, that is the 15 and 1600s uh, of the common era. Uh, and to do that, I, I, I first want to um, present a, a bit of the, co the contents uh, of, of the Dasot here. As I mentioned um, uh, slightly earlier, the, the Dasot here is uh, associated uh, with a, a group of thinkers um, uh, which culminate in the production of the Dabastan and Mazaheb, the School of Doctrines, an encyclopedia of religions produced in 1650s India, uh, but which begins um, with uh, an Iranian thinker said to have been born in the city of Istakh near modern uh, Shiraz uh, in, in 
um, Western Iran uh, named Azar Kevan. Azar Kevan uh, was, was a mystic, uh, someone who uh, was born presumably sometime in the middle of the 16th century, the 1500s, and who died uh, in India, um, where he traveled uh, in 1618. Interestingly, Azar Kevan claimed to be reviving the religion of ancient Persia, which he described uh, as consisting uh, primarily of the worship of the celestial bodies, uh, especially uh, the uh, seven planets as they were understood, that is the sun, the moon, um, Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, uh, Jupiter, uh, and Saturn, whose idols, as they were depicted uh, in the Dabistan, uh, you can see here on the slide. Azar Kevan claimed that the scripture of the ancient Iranians was a text that he had access to, a text called the Dasatir e Osmani, uh, which we've already uh, described as having been uh, given its final shape by someone called Sasana Panjom, who lived uh, in the early years of the Sasanian Empire, that is prior to the conquest of Iran, but containing texts stretching back millions of years uh, into the past. If we have a look at its contents, uh, the Dasatir consists of 16 chapters, uh, each of which is associated with a different king. Those of you who are familiar with uh, Iranian traditional history, as it's understood from texts like the Shahnameh, uh, know that uh, traditionally the first king of Iran is understood to be called someone called Gayumars or Kiyumars, uh, who here you'll see is, is instead given as the fifth uh, king of Iran. Prior to the time of Kayumars, uh, numerous uh, individuals uh, from what is called the, the Abadi uh, era, or the Abadi dynasty, according to the Dasatir and later texts from the school, are said to have reigned over Iran for periods of enormous uh, amounts of time, really millions uh, of years. You can see that uh, when you uh, look at each of the chapters of the Dasatir, uh, a great number of them uh, consist of liturgical materials. After a sort of introductory chapter about cosmology, um, you can see a series of prayers uh, stretching out for the next uh, 10 chapters, uh, and then ultimately coming down uh, to uh, the time of Kechos Rose, Artosht, and Eskandar, uh, in which you get some narrative material, uh, and then finally uh, some commentarial material. Um, now, I've already said uh, that uh, the text of the Dasatir in Persian is composed in pure Persian, uh, which is something that's a bit hard to sort of imagine if you're not sort of a speaker of the Persian language. And these are technical subjects that are being discussed uh, in the text, uh, cosmology, eschatology, uh, liturgy, philosophy, uh, and so on. And so writing in pure Persian um, and substituting the normal technical language of Persian largely derived from Arabic for a vocabulary derived from Persian uh, is, is, is uh, strange to say the least. So to give a, a taste of that, I thought I would uh, begin by uh, uh, presenting a, a somewhat uh, kindred experiment in trying to write in pure English. Uh, that is English with no French or Latin or uh, Greek loan words, uh, but rather words that only have etymological origin uh, in Old English or Anglo-Saxon. This is a, a modern text uh, called Unkleftish Beholding, uh, composed by Paul Anderson in 1989, the sci-fi author. For most of its being, mankind did not know what things were made of, but could only guess. With the growth of world ken, we began to learn, and today we have a beholding of stuff and work that watching bears out, both in the workstead and in daily life. The underlying kinds of stuff are the first stuffs, which link together in sundry ways to give rise to the rest. Formerly, we knew of 92 first stuffs, from water stuff, the lightest and barest, to emir stuff, the heaviest. Now we've made more, such as agir stuff and hell stuff. And the text goes on. Today, when we wield both kind of uncleftish doings and weapons and kernelish splitting gives us heat and burnstoneness, we hope to do likewise with together melting, which would yield an unhemmed wellspring of work for mankindish good gain. Soothly, we live in mighty years. Well, I think the experience uh, for most of you in hearing this text is, is something of an uncanny one, right? The words are familiar, 
and, and, and largely intelligible, or at least we think we understand them. But when one sort of comes to think about what's actually being you know, described by the text, one really has to do sort of a great deal of like mental exercise to, to actually get at what the point of the text is. And that's precisely because the text has all of these sort of un, uncanny words, world can, beholding, first stuff, water stuff, emir stuff, eager stuff, hell stuff, uncleftish, burnstoneness, together melting, kernelish splitting, mankindish good gain, and so on. And so you have to have you know, something of a, of, a, of a skeleton key in mind, whereby you can sort of substitute these neologisms, these, these coinings of pure English with more familiar words. And so here's the same text uh, with those, you know, especially strange words uh, substituted uh, with words uh, of, of foreign origin, right? That is French words, Latin words, Greek words, and so on. Words like science, theory, laboratory, elements, hydrogen, uranium, neptunium, plutonium, atomic, nuclear fission, electricity, fusion, uh, uh, and so on, right? In other words, you know, to write a scientific text, we, we rely on technical vocabulary, vocabulary which very often has origins in foreign languages. So now I think we're ready to sort of understand what the Dasotir does. Right? First, I'll just uh, you know, read a couple Dasotiri texts. This is uh, first the, the language of heaven itself, according to the text. Um, hey, Nushrod, hey, Nushrod Ramam, or Nushrod Sorom, Tosh Raman has Dal Raman. Hey, Tajram, uh, Nush Taj Raman, O Yod Raman. Hey, Dihmiram, Ture Raman, Lund Raman, Rund Raman. Hey, Karur Fartashram, Hey, Zur Wanram, Hey, Wanram, O Rangram, O, o Roshangram. Right? So, uh, you know, one can immediately sort of you know, get the sense that, yeah, this doesn't really resemble human language. Almost every word has Ram somewhere in it, usually at the end. And also some aspects of it look a little familiar to Persian, especially when you compare it side by side with the, the corresponding Persian text. Uh, but here's the Persian that, that corresponds to that, also uh, a bit strange sounding, although now uh, more uh, intelligible. E parastesh dar khureman o parastesh sazavare hame hasti paziroftagan as forudin di danion ke yoftagane panj yabandagane tanonand. Vazabarinon <laughs> Okay, so you know we know all these words. Anyone who studied Persian is familiar with this vocabulary, but still the sense is weird, right? You know what what do these words all mean? If one were to sort of attempt a literal translation of that text, as I did when I first encountered it, you might wind up wind up with a translation that looks something like this: "Oh, my one worthy of worship, one worthy of worship by all existence receivers of the lower visible ones, those found by the five finders of bodies, and the upper intelligibles who cannot be found by bodies." O oh, distributor of souls and wisdoms, O oh, bringer into existence of the columns and roots of enigmas, O oh, in any case existent, O oh, rainer down of pardons, O oh, doer, turner, sower, and maker of hearts and souls. This is attributed to the ancient king Yasan. Right? Very bizarre translation. Um, very difficult you know, to really get a sense of what's being described, although uh, already we have an idea uh, that uh, some of the vocabulary uh, might uh, be reminiscent of vocabulary that we also see in Islamic philosophy. Words like in any case existent, right, might, uh, might ring a bell with the notion of the wajab al wujud or the, the necessary existent um, and so on. So anyway, this is sort of where I was uh, with the, the Dasotir when I first encountered the text. I, of course, knew the translation of Mullah Firuz and, and Duncan, which made a lot more sense than this, but I was wondering how they had arrived at that translation, um, you know, how, how they were certain, for instance, that the in any case existent equaled the necessary existent uh, and so on. So I sought uh, in the first instance to, to try to find out what the sources of this text were uh, and, and whether we could make any sort of heads or tails of it. And so to do that, I, I, I went into uh, the broader literature um, uh, surrounding Azar Kevan and his followers. 
uh, in which one can find uh, a number of, of hagiographies, both of the life of, of Ozark Avon uh, and of his disciples. Um, um, these hagiographies are found in texts like the Dabastrani Mazlaheb, as well as earlier texts. Um, and here's an example of one which might give us, you know, some sort of sense as to what exactly that prayer that really didn't make any sense that we just read might have been. This is a biography of someone who called himself Hirbed, or a kind of Zoroastrian priest um, who was living in Lahore in the uh, mid 17th century. We read, he spent his time reciting prayers in Persian, Hindi, and Arabic, so already trilingual, about the greatness of the light of lights, Nul Anvar, the archetypal lights, Anvar e Qahire, and the planets, Kaval Keb. Okay, well, I know even from a very uh, cursory reading of the Dabastan that these are indeed the kind of texts that one finds in the Dabastan. He understood the Qibla to be the luminous bodies, that is, he prayed to the planets, um, and he knew the compositions of Sora Vardi well, right, Sheikh Maktoul. Uh, this, uh, this line that he knew the compositions of Sohra Vardi immediately, you know, raised a, a flag in my mind. Okay, what kinds of compositions of, of, of the uh, Iranian uh, philosopher, the Islamic philosopher of Sohra Vardi are we talking about? Are we talking about his writings on, on logic, on ontology, or might it be something else? So, like I think many uh, who have been interested in Azak Kevan and the Dabastan, I, I immediately um, plunged myself into reading the various uh, works of, of Sohra Vardi. Uh, and at first wasn't finding much, um, you know, other than, you know, basic vocabulary, illuminationary or, you know, illuminative vocabulary, words like the, the light of lights and so on, uh, that, that would uh, allow me immediately to identify those Dasatiri texts with, with the writings of Sohra Vardi. Uh, it wasn't until I uh, stumbled over a text that was then, you know, published only in sort of scattered places, primarily um, in the first instance by the French scholar Henri Corbin, uh, who I'll be coming to again at the end of the talk, uh, a text called the, the Book of Prayers uh, in Sanctifications in Arabic, Kitab uh, al-Waradat for Taktisat. Here, a manuscript of that text uh, copied in the 13th century, uh, consisting of uh, precisely uh, prayers uh, attributed to Sohra Vardi uh, um, uh, in um, precisely uh, uh, liturgical usage uh, to the seven planets, to the light of lights, uh, and, and many other um, contexts. And it was here, I think, that I, that I found, um, you know, what was essentially the key to deciphering the, the Dasatiri texts. Now, keep in mind that Sohra Vardi like Azar Kevon after him, claimed um, to be reviving in his own philo philosophical project the <clears throat> philosophy uh, of the ancient Persians. He writes uh, in a short text, um, there was in Persia a community guided by truth and doing justice according to it. They were virtuous sages, not like the Magians, not like the Zoroastrians that we know. Indeed, we revived their noble and illuminated wisdom to which Plato and earlier sages bore witness in the book entitled Hekmat al-Ishraq, The Wisdom of Illumination. I was not preceded in anything like it. So after studying Sohra Vardi, uh, in particular Sohra Vardi's Persianisms, his Iranisms, in which he begins to claim a ancient Iranian genealogy for his philosophical project, and in particular for his so-called occult and devotional materials, the book of prayers and sanctifications, uh, I began to see numerous parallels uh, between the text of the Dasatir and the writings uh, of Sheikh Maktoul. So much so, in fact, that I quickly realized that the Dasatiri text was actually a word-for-word -word translation of Sohra Vardi's uh, prayers. Um, here, that same uh, prayer that we read at the beginning of the lecture, uh, or just a few minutes ago, um, you know, beginning with, oh my God, uh, we can see um, just precisely how close the first celestial language and then the Persian language follow Sohra Vardi's text, right? Ya ilahi. A parastesh dar choreman, right? How do you translate Allah? How do you translate God into Persian, right? Well, being worthy of sacrifice, 
or being worthy of worship rather is, is the, the choice uh, um, made by the Persian translator, right? Um, how do you translate a technical word like mojudat? Okay, you know, existent, hasti pazirofte, or hasti pazeroftegon, right? The, those beings who have accepted being, right? Um, uh, uh, and so on. So um, I wondered after I found, you know, some of these early examples of, of, of translation texts um, in the Dasautir, whether I might find more of them. Um, oh, first, um, uh, to give a sort of more intelligible translation of that same text with the help of Sohravardi, now able to understand that that text means, oh my God, oh God of all existent beings, whether they be sensible or intelligible, oh giver of souls and intelligences, oh inventor of the pillars and origins of essences, oh necessary existent, oh giver of grace, oh maker of hearts and souls. Okay, so now the text makes a lot more sense now that I can see it with its original sort of technical vocabulary from Sohravardi. Um, in some cases uh, in manuscripts, we can actually see uh, in, the, uh, in the margins of the text uh, that, the, um, uh, that the commenters of the text actually understood um, uh, that uh, the, uh, those sort of complex Persian neologisms corresponded exactly uh, to the Arabic vocabulary of Sohravardi. So here, um, a hymn to the planet uh, Jupiter, and you have, uh, you know, in the Persian, the word bimuri, right? Uh, which seems like it has something to do with, with fear. Uh, and it's glossed in the margin of the Dasotir as uh, mahalbat, right? And then that corresponds directly to the, uh, to the word for word Arabic translation um, from uh, Sohravardi's prayers and sanctifications. Turns out that a great number of the texts in the Dasotir correspond directly to Sohravardi, right? So no need obviously to read these slides, but essentially uh, beginning with chapter three of the Dasotir and continuing for most of its contents, remember it's a, chapter, it's a text with 16 chapters. So continuing for, for nine chapters uh, through the reign of Minucher, each of the central prayers of the chapters of the Dasotir correspond in a word for word fashion uh, to, uh, to the text uh, of Sohravardi's um, planetary hymns and sanctifications. Going further in the corpus of the Dasotir uh, requires uh, one to sort of expand one's uh, horizons a little bit uh, in searching for sources. Um, you know, there are, there are a number of texts on cosmology, eschatology, ontology, uh, and so on, uh, which also have strong resonances uh, with other texts um, in, in Arabic uh, philosophy, but none more so than a text which is attributed to Zarathustra, the sort of central prophet of the Zoroastrian tradition, uh, in which Zarathustra is said to have converted uh, Pythagoras, the Greek sage, uh, and Vyasa, the, the Indian sage, uh, to be his followers. Uh, and in his encounter uh, with Vyasa, he relates a narrative um, which predicts Vyasa's question uh, about um, ultimately justifying uh, vegetarianism uh, about a complaint made by the, the kings of the different kingdoms of animals uh, to the king of kings uh, of the universe. Uh, and you can see just an example of uh, that, that text um, you know, here as it was published in the, in the Dasotir publication. I think this text uh, you know, is familiar to essentially anyone uh, who has uh, studied classical Arabic literature. It's an extraordinarily well-known uh, narrative and it's sort of shocking to me um, that uh, no one except for one commentator in the beginning of the 19th century has ever pointed this out. But this is simply an abridged narrative of a text from the epistles of the Brethren of Purity, right? the Resayel Ikhwan Safa, uh, probably the most famous part of that, that, uh, that corpus known as the case of animals uh, versus man before the king of the jinn. Here you can see it in translation. And indeed, though it's not a word for word translation in this case, because it's a very long text in Arabic and it's a very, you know, a relatively short text in Persian, still there are sort of clear signs uh, that we are looking at a translation when we look at the text of the Dasot here. The wise fox said, your former clothes were of wool and hair and the skins of animals and still are. And your sweetest food is from the vomit of the bee. Right? This is, you know, saying that mankind relies upon animals for their well-being. 
we find you know exact uh, you know correspondences or near correspondences to both of these sentences uh, within uh, within the uh, case of the animals before the king of the jinn, right? You do the same with the fleece you take from sheep and the hides of beasts, the wool and hair of carnivores, the feather of birds. Your finest food is honey, the spittle of the bees, right? So um, some very uh, close uh, correspondences um, between the two texts. Okay, so um, that's where I thought things sort of ended with the Daslet here. I thought I had sort of cracked the text, right? That it was essentially a translation of earlier works of, of uh, Arabic philosophy into Persian uh, and given um, a sort of ancient pedigree as if these texts had uh, originated um, uh, not in the um, sort of immediate Islamic context, but rather uh, in the pre-Islamic Iranian uh, world. Uh, that's what I thought until I was sent um, photographs of a manuscript by my close uh, uh, friend and colleague, who I think is on this call, uh, librarian at the, the British Library, per, uh, curator of Persian manuscripts for the India office, that is Ursula Sims Williams. Um, this is British Library manuscript, Oriental manuscript 11967, a manuscript of the Dasotir, uh, in which on the one hand, you can see these you know, really cool marginal comments, uh, in which uh, very often the corresponding Arabic word is given for these strange Persian words. Um, but when one gets to the end of the Dasotir as it was published by Mola Firuz, uh, the, the British Library manuscript continues uh, to give a series of other texts, texts in other languages, in fact, um, um, uh, which apparently are being presented as if they are in some way or another uh, expressing similar ideas to those ideas expressed within the Dasotir. The first text says, Setoyesh Khurshid as Zand, right? So, as a urinologist, I immediately recognize this text uh, as being in the ancient Iranian Avestan language and given a, a Persian commentary, right? So, it begins, you can see my sort of uh, uh, interlinear reading of it on the left. Khwarak Shaitam Amesham Rayam Arwat Asbam Yazamaide, right? Um, we uh, in the Persian translation, we worship or I worship, as it says, you know, the the sun, I guess, which never dies, the immortal sun, uh, which, you know, goes well, according to the Persian, the one of powerful horses. Uh, you know, finally, the, the, the manuscript gives a sort of summation of the first part of that text, which we know to be um, the Zoroastrian uh, litany to the sun. The meaning of that whole prayer is that I hold as great the chief of the world whom God, may he be exalted, has made great, to whom he has given a light before that of the other planets, i.e. the moving and shining stars, and he has revealed the pause end of this, the commentary of this in the book. All right, so immediately I thought to myself, okay, well, not only are they writing and, you know, pronouncing prayers to the planets uh, and, uh, and, you know, the sun, but indeed they're, they're collecting uh, prayers in other languages to those same entities. Um, going further uh, in the manuscript, uh, one finds other texts and other languages here. Zabane Sanskrit, mar vakshuran vakshur abadra, right? So in the, in the Sanskrit language attributed to the prophet of prophets, Abad, the first man. Knowing a little bit of Sanskrit and you know doing a little bit of philological gymnastics, I sort of tried to convert this text into like real Sanskrit, or rather grammatically correct Sanskrit, um, uh, and sort of arrived at, at the following translation: Niranjanaya Namaha, uh, Anakaraya Namaha, etc. So homage to the one without color, homage to the one without form, homage to the one without birth, homage to the Lord of Wisdom, homage to the Lord of the Soul, homage to the Lord of the Godhead, homage to the Lord of the Sky, uh, and so on. Okay, so still a kind of prayer, um, which has some, you know, natural and celestial components in it, at least. Further text, this one is, is, is um, you know, called Turkish, although it's sort of, you know, Turkish-ish, it's kind of gibberish, right, um, as far as I can make out, but, you know, uh, following the uh, the interlinear Persian translation anyway, great is the name of the Lord, praise befits God. You can see that there is some, you know, real Turkish component to this, right? God is called Tangran, right? You can think of the Turkish word Tangri, God, you know, um, there, uh, and some other sort of Turkish sounding uh, words um, in, in the whole text. And then finally, uh, a piece which sort of clinched the whole uh, story and brought it back to Sohrivardi, uh, 
series of prayers uh, in Arabic, uh, which are given at the end of the manuscript, um, uh, including um, the, the sort of prayer that's most of the way down the page here, beginning Bismillah Allahumma, um, a text which corresponds directly to one of Sohravardi's Waradat, right? His Warad Takdisul Atla, right? His, his supreme um, uh, prayer uh, to be used on, on every day. Right um, here, you can see uh, the exact correspondences between the Arabic manuscript from the Hagia Sophia Library uh, and and the, the Persian Dasotir manuscript. So you know, I ultimately came to the uh, the idea that the Dasotir was you know in many ways uh, a text which paralleled the compilation of the School of Doctrines, the Encyclopedia of Comparative Religion that I was so interested in. That is, that not only was it a text of of liturgies prescribed by Azar Kevan. Uh, but that it too uh, was a kind of uh, universalizing and comparative project uh, in which liturgical texts from different traditions were collected uh, in a common setting, in a common frame, just as the Dabistan collects uh, accounts of the beliefs of the Persians, the Hindus, the Tibetans, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims, uh, and a number of other groups, including philosophers and Sufis, into one place, so too the Dasatir attempts to put a single universal framework uh, on, on um, these diverse uh, texts of, of, of multilingual um, origins. I have a lot more to say about this uh, and about the, the Dabistan. Um, I have an article coming out about the Dabistan uh, soon in, in modern Asian studies for anyone who's sort of interested in this. Uh, but for today's talk, I want to sort of restrict myself to the Dasatir. Um, and, and come again now uh, to uh, the sort of latter day reception of the text and its various histories uh, in order to sort of bring this talk to a close and hopefully um, uh, um, stir some conversation that those of you who are in really diverse fields um, um, might um, be able to participate in. Um, the Dasotir was a, a, a text uh, which um, was read essentially from the time of its uh, completion, um, presumably in the 16th century, uh, down into the modern period. Uh, primarily, its linguistic influence was felt um, because of the inclusion of its strange Persian words uh, in the 17th century uh, lexicographical compilation dictionary, Borhan uh, al uh, the, um, the sort of decisive proof, uh, which was composed uh, in mid 17th century, um, uh, in the mid 17th century Deccan uh, near the city of Hyderabad. And from there, its words, its strange Persian words, gradually entered into the Persian language, especially by uh, poets who sought, you know, for various reasons to channel a kind of ancient Iranian vibe uh, in, in their language, poets both in India and in Iran. This only uh, sort of continued to escalate following the, pop, uh, the publication of the Dasotir, uh, both in Persian and in English translation in 1818. One of the texts sort of most noteworthy readers in the 19th century was the uh, Indian poet, Mughal uh, poet laureate at the time of the fall of the Mughal dynasty, the poet Ghalib of Delhi, uh, who um, in various places talks about the Dasatir and his readings of the text, he claims in fact, to have had an Iranian tutor in the Persian language uh, who was a kind of crypto Zoroastrian, right? So someone who, who sort of um, harkens back to that uh, Azar Kevani uh, school. But at the end of a text that Ghalib composed in 1858, narrating the events of the uh, Indian revolt of 1857, Ghalib concludes his narrative, which interestingly is composed again in pure Persian using no Arabic words. Um, the final line of the poem uh, right. or something, sorry, I can't, didn't write this down. Uh, our book uh, forms a, a portion of the Dasatir uh, in skill, uh, sorry, Bekardani Moim, sorry, in skill, I am the, the sixth Sasan. So Ghalib here compares himself then to the compiler of the, the Dasatir. Elsewhere, Ghalib writes that during the 1857 uprising, uh, he had no books with him. He had to wait out the, uh, the events of 
1857 in his home. And the only books he had in his house uh, were in fact the Dasotir uh, and the Persian dictionary Borhonakote, right? Um, and it was reading these texts uh, during the events of the uprising of 1857, which inspired him ultimately to write his narration of, of those events called Dastambu or Bouquet. Now, Ghalib wasn't the only sort of reader of the Dasaltir in the mid-century. Uh, the text um, had been published uh, in Bombay, but brought first to England and from there to America. Um, and uh, indeed found its way into the hands of the American transcendental philosopher, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, who published extracts from the Dasaltir uh, in his journal in, the, in 1843, uh, The Dial. Uh, here you can see actually exactly the same text that we read um, from the prophet Yasan uh, in his quote, ethnical scriptures, a series of articles in which um, uh, texts from the Sanskrit, the Persian and the Greek traditions were put in conversation with, with one another, uh, all uh, sort of ascribed a kind of, you know, underlying uh, sort of naturalistic theology, Neoplatonic emanationist um, type uh, theology. In the center, you can see Emerson's personal copy of the Dasatir uh, today in the Concord Museum of Massachusetts. Thanks, Jenny, I know you're on this call uh, for, for sending this to me. Uh, and finally, you can see the kind of afterlife uh, that Emerson's publication of the Dasaltir has had. This is, you know, from the local newspaper of Allentown, Pennsylvania. Thought for today, you know, right between facts about Allentown and healthful diet for the normal girl, you have time as a portion of the revolution of the great heaven and the relation of one transient thing with another. The events of the world move with the movement of the spheres. Dasaltir. Uh, you know, who in Evanston, uh, or sorry, who in Allentown, uh, you know, was 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 reading uh, Emerson's translation of the Dasaltir? I really, I really want to know this. Other, uh, you know, contemporary, uh, you know, mid 19th century uh, thinkers um, who were shaped in one way or another uh, by a reading of the Dasaltir uh, were connected to Indian Parsis uh, who in particular began to take ownership of this text. Uh, none more so uh, in the mid century than Manikji Limji Hataria pictured big on the left uh, who uh, worked as the emissary of the uh, Indian Parsi community uh, in Iran uh, during the period between the 1850s and on and off until the 1880s, 1890s. Um, here, uh, just a sort of a gallery of his, uh, of his correspondence, all of whom in one place or another, uh, you know, began to adopt the narrative of the Dasatir, in particular its narrative of Iranian kingship beginning not with Kayumaris, but with Mahabad, uh, this ancient figure um, in one or another of, of their works. It's a really international crew, right? So not only Iranian thinkers, Indian thinkers, but French, Russian, uh, Japanese thinkers uh, all included on it. One, uh, you know, particularly prominent, you know, figure among this group uh, was uh, Manakji's contemporary, the prophet uh, Baha'u'llah, who Manakji corresponded with and whom Manakji encouraged to write in pure Persian. Uh, Baha'u'llah, you know, in one of his responses to Manakji, begins to talk about the beliefs, not just of the Zoroastrians, but also of the Mahal Bodhi uh, prophets. Um, so, uh, so, so, you know, Baha'u'llah too, to a certain degree, um, you know, is, is an heir, um, you know, to this tradition. One of my favorite um, sort of spots uh, in which the, uh, the Dassault's tear story, you know, takes you to is something that I was able to pursue, uh, as you can see in the silly photo of me, uh, just before the pandemic broke out, uh, to Osceola, Missouri, right, sort of what I, uh, you know, heart of the Ozarks uh, in, in the Midwestern part of the United States. Uh, in which uh, in the later part of the 19th century in 1888, a journal uh, was being published sort of uh, in the spirit of Emerson's dial called The Platonist, an exponent of philosophical truth, edited by Thomas Moore Johnson, right? Uh, in which you can see that a new translation of the Dasaltir is given in English. Um, uh, you can see there on the table of contents, the celestial Dasaltir to the great prophet Abad by Mirza Muhammad Hadi, uh, published in Osceola. Well, I, I found out, you know, from some creative Googling um, that Thomas Moore Johnson's grandson is alive, still alive, mashallah, uh, in Osceola, um, Tom Johnson Jr. Uh, 
Uh, and not only that, but he has kept his grandfather's library intact, more or less in untouched fashion, uh, um, and gives tours of this library in Osceola um, uh, to anyone who's interested in seeing it. So I, of course, was interested in seeing this, this library uh, and, and wrote to, to Tom in, in August of, of 2019. Uh, uh, happened to be in the Midwest, so drove to Missouri, stopped off at the, the cheese stop in Osceola, uh, which you can see me with the mouse there, uh, and, and, visited, uh, and visited his library. Um, and there, uh, one can actually find uh, letters, the correspondence of, of, um, of Mirza Muhammad Hadi with, uh, with Tom Moore, Thomas Moore Johnson uh, in, in Osceola. Now, uh, Mirza Muhammad Hadi describes himself as a, quote, Muslim Platonist there at the end of that, that first page, uh, and offers Thomas Moore Johnson to retranslate uh, the, the Dasot here and asks him whether he can come live in America, whether he can come find uh, employment uh, in in Missouri as a teacher uh, of, of philosophy there. I have to thank uh, Patrick Bowen uh, who, who published these letters uh, for, for sending me, uh, for sending me um, his, uh, his versions of this. These are now um, you know, being digitized and kept in a, in a uh, project with Missouri State University. Well, it turns out that that Mirza Muhammad Hadi is an uh, extremely famous uh, individual in India. He's the author of what is sometimes called the Urdu language's first novel, Umrao John Ada, right? Or the story of uh, Umrao John, the courtesan, uh, which is perhaps famous to us today, uh, thanks to an incredibly popular Indian film. Um, you can see the film poster here from 1981. The film, you know, one of my favorite films uh, in, uh, in the history of, of Indian cinema. Uh, and, and just sort of mind boggling to think that the same person who wrote this, this beautiful account of, of mid, -century, mid 19th century uh, Northern India was, was corresponding uh, with someone in the middle of you know, the Ozark Mountains and, 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 and post-Civil War uh, Missouri and indeed uh, wanted to, to come emigrate there um, in his early life. All right, uh, I'm just going to conclude now um, uh, by talking about the sort of lingering impact of the Dassault here on the field. Uh, and I really look forward to, to your questions and answers, uh, to your questions and discussion uh, in just a moment. Uh, perhaps more than anyone in the 20th century, uh, the individual who uh, was most preoccupied with the legacies of, of Sohravardi and their ties to pre Islamic uh, Iran uh, was Henri Corbin, the French scholar who lived in Iran for a number of years in the middle of the 20th century, um, who devoted um, you know, his life, not just uh, you know, in the early phases of his life to translating Heidegger into French, but also to uh, making the works of Sohravardi much better known uh, through his uh, editions and translations of the text. Uh, Corbin uh, also uh, was one of the few scholars in the 20th century to take Azar Kevan and his followers seriously, rather than dismissing a text like the Dasot here, simply as derivative mere forgery. So I want to just sort of think about, you know, Corbin's notion of the place of Iran in philosophy, um, and, uh, and think with this, this text about what it might, you know, mean for us as historians uh, of the intellectual history of Iran, um, uh, how we might um, you know, both push back against what Corbin has to say, but also uh, to think about historicizing uh, precisely these, you know, long durée uh, kinds of intellectual connections between ancient Iran and modern and modern uh, the modern periods. Corbin writes, although we have identified motifs originating in ancient Iran within the morphological diversity of post-Islamic Iran, the whole gamut of Shiite forms, crypto Ismaili, Sufism, Ishraqi philosophy, alchemy, etc. It is not their mere material presence which gives them their meaning. By accepting such a limitation, one is immediately exposed to skillful criticism as to the auth authenticity of this or that material data, stamp of origin, etc. What really confers meaning is the historically new fact, the founding will which brought possibilities into, fla into flower, into being in the present then and there. This bringing into the present is an eminently personal act. The actors themselves in such an event this Heideggerian, uh, do not represent it in the form of an impersonal causality of the coming about of separate events which impinge upon them. I have to sort of move this thing on my slide. This act of philosophical founding is an irreproachable witness to the significance in action of a motif and leads the possibility of the past back into the present 
It is essentially a hermeneutic by understanding it, the interpreter implicitly takes on responsibility for what he understands. It is within this hermeneutical circle thereby drawn that we can see how it is possible to speak in the terms with which we begin this essay of Iranian continuity, consistency, and wholeness, right? This idea of Iran that's so often asserted in our field without really thinking about what that means in an authentic philosophical sense. As in all other categories of philosophical existence, the work and the pleroma of works do not have the same type of consistency as that of material data. They must never be considered as acquired from a fully formed heritage, which can be taken for granted, but as an obligation which one either assumes, challenges, or betrays. Only Iranian studies itself can achieve its philosophical program. Its traces have already been indicated by philosophers in Iran and by Iranian influences on philosophers. Now, in the sort of um, uh, English-speaking world, uh, in, in, um, in uh, the UK and America, scholars often have a problem with Henri Corbin's, you know, sort of notion of perennial wisdom and his, his sort of trans-historical approach uh, to these texts is in some ways, you know, very much against, you know, reading with the historical context, but rather, you know, trying to think about, you know, archetypal forms and, you know, their, uh, you know, hermeneutics in the moment in, of, of texts and, you know, uh, in which they are composed. Uh, but I think about, you know, um, uh, Corban a lot when I try to think about, you know, the place of ancient Iran within the broader field of Iranian studies uh, and within um, the, uh, the sort of general narrative of, of the Iranian national imaginary, the, the idea of Iran as, as it's been called in so many of our various places. And so I thought, you know, what's useful to sort of take from, from Corban, but also Corban's failure to notice that Azar Kevan was merely recycling um, Sohravardi rather than sort of harmonizing with Sohravardi uh, is this sort of notion of a feedback loop within Iranian studies, right? That we tend to think of this as being a sort of linear, uh, you know, sort of narrative in which ancient Zoroastrian ideas go on in some very complex ways to shape what is, you know, essentially, uh, you know, called syncretism uh, with origins in Chaldeanism and Hellenism uh, and then, um, you know, the, the later Roman Empire, so called the Chaldeo-Greco-Romanism, Iranian syncretism, yeah, Chaldeo-Greco-Roman Iranian syncretism, that's really a mouthful. Uh, phenomena you can think of like Mithraism, uh, like the harmonies between Iranian thought and Neoplatonism with, and Gnosticism, Manichaeism and so on. That feeding into this notion of an Iranian Islam, which Corbin, uh, a term Corbin coined, uh, which he located um, in Ismailism, in the Ishraqis, the followers of, of Sotavardi, in Sufism, uh, and so on. But then that Iranian Islam going back into you know, Zoroastrianism, I think is the sort of cr the crucial move I'd like to make here, um, that uh, you know, Azar Kevan uh, on the one hand, is someone who um, apparently is uh, familiar with Zoroastrian texts from the Avesta, like the Kharshid Niyayishan that is given in that um, manuscript of the Dasalatir, and yet who is very, very much shaped by this sort of Iranian Islam, um, as Korban called it, of, of Sohravardi. All right, just finally to conclude, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with the words of, of contemporary, or you know, the recently deceased, uh, but, but modern, Urdu author Nair Masood, uh, who uh, was among other things, the, the translator of Franz Kafka, but whose um, approach to the Dasatir and to the fifth Sasan, um, he uh, records uh, in a very short story um, in a collection of stories called Itri Kafur, or the essence of camphor, sort of, you know, describes this, you know, sort of meaning at the moment uh, of, of the time of the text co composition, as well as the sort of tension between the sort of uh, disenchanted moment of the present in trying to encounter uh, and trying to encounter those texts of the past. Masood writes, the sum of the entire investigation of our scholars, and as the scholars of the Dasletir, was that there was no fifth Sasan, nor was any language put forward by him, nor did that language have a single word in it, nor did that word have any meanings, right? So the idea of Dasaltir as gibberish. However, the sum of the entire investigation was also that at one time, there were some meanings that were expressed through certain words, and these words were ascribed to a language, and one person introduced that language, and that person called himself the fifth Sosan. Thank you very much for your time, and I really look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, for this uh, real,
just uh, tour de force um, presentation and uh, and the the broad synchronic and diachronic reception uh, of of the dasatir. It just raises so many questions for conversation. Uh, lots of things are going through my mind. I just want to uh, note again that if you have questions. Uh, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section for all of our audience members. And I see some questions coming in. Um, I the the As you were giving this talk, I kept thinking and turning back to Henri Corban. And so I was really thrilled to see you and put a bow on it <laughs> um, at, at the very end and and, and bring into this pro problem of, of Iranian Islam and um, syncretism. I, I also was just fascinated and thrilled to see the very detailed connections with Sohravardi and the the Waridat and Takdisat that you uh, outlined so clearly, and um, it raises many many kind of questions for me um, about also the the these kind of twin forces of um, adding a Zoroastrian flair to this work and also taking it out to kind of back and forth. Um, and what I mean by that is. Um, uh, the, the, this, the prayers to planets, planetary prayers, um, as a as a phenomenon in quintessentially Islamic writings, um, and and how, for instance, Razi, who has a lot in, indebted to Sohravardi very clearly, and is operating in an interesting milieu, um, it, it, it puts this into the Sabians, you know, um, uh, very similar sets of prayers. Uh, and so, I'm just curious about what's at stake as we bring in these questions with something being coded in the in a Zoroastrian framework or not um, uh, in in these writings. Uh, so, for instance, in the pseudo Aristotelian Hermetica, we have the um, Nerang everywhere, but they're not framed as um, part of a Mazdian practice as such, but clearly they are in, in some important way. So I'd be curious to hear about that, about what's at stake and, and or or in, in what way it modulates how uh, the 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 Mazdian or, or Zoroastrian elements come to the fore in certain contexts, but are recede in others. Uh, that's a broad question, but um, maybe that could give us some framework to, to come into the conversation. Sure. I mean, I, I think that's a terrific question. It's one that I really am, am grappling with because I don't really know, um, you know, exactly how to, uh, I mean, th there's, there's no sort of, the good thing about philology is you can really show something as a sort of word for word translation, but when it comes to these bigger questions, there's no sort of silver bullet that can just solve them, right? So, so in this one in particular of, um, you know, first of all, what was Sohravardi doing, right? When he, um, ascribes his philosophical system to ancient Iran. We, th that to me is just the great sort of million dollar question. You know, why did he do that? Why are there these Persian features in his in his prayers to the planets? When, you know, he, his hymn to the sun uses the word huraksh for the sun, you know, which is quarak shaitam in Avestan. Because these are not, I mean, worshiping the planets is, is, is alien essentially to the Zoroastrian tradition in which the planets are understood to be, you know, uh, demons. Mm -hmm. um, um, but you know, one sort of curious thing, I guess, about the Dasatir, just to just to throw one you know crazy thing out, I guess, is that you know the uh, another person whom we think probably had some connection to the Sohravardian tradition from not too much earlier than 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 um, Azar Kevan, um, and uh, and whose manuscripts were collected, you know, in precisely the same Ottoman context as uh, as those manuscripts of Sohravardi I showed. Um, was the late Byzantine philosopher George Mistos Plethon, um, who, um, you know, similarly in his book of laws, No Moy, which I sort of think as being, um, you know, kind of akin to the notion of Dasatir, Book of Regulations, um, gives, uh, gives a series of, of planetary invocations, uh, and who is, you know, sometimes by his detractors described as having been, um, uh, you know, taught the doctrines of Zoroaster. And interestingly, Pletho, in his um, edition of the Chaldean Oracles, is the first to attribute those texts, you know, another one of these kind of syncretistic, um, you know, Zoroastrian texts from antiquity. He's the first, he's the first to attribute those Chaldean Oracles not to the Chaldeans, but to Zoroaster, or rather Zoroaster the Chaldean. Um, so, you know, you there's slippage between what is Chaldean or Sabian, depending on whether you're reading it in, in the West or in um, uh, or in the Islamic context. Um, uh, with Persian attributions, right? And, and so you already see this kind of monolithic notion of the ancient kingdoms and, and ancient, you know, monotheisms of Persia, of Chaldea, of, of, um, of Egypt, um, you know, cropping up in many different places. Um, it, so. it, it, it reminds me in a way of the a kind of um, the, 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 the perception of Zoroastrians in uh, that uh, De Jong highlights so clearly in the traditions of the Magi, the, um, mm -hmm. that we have a kind of exoticization in some measure, and that this is a space where we can 
lump a variety of occult practices uh, yes. quintessentially. And, uh, and so it, it, another kind of pseudo epigraphic, I know you've written on it, uh, work that, that does this is the Akame Jamasp. And um, mm -hmm. I'd be curious about, um, you know, how, how this circulates both amongst Zoroastrians and, um, and, mm -hmm. and Muslims too, right? From my, my limited reading of the work. Um, yep. And that it, you know, how is the exotic? I'm just, I would be, the, I'd like to hear you think with it or tell us about, about yeah, the, yeah, no, the, it's the terrific. Forces, I mean, both within and outside the community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, both are tied to, um, you know, notions of millennialism and, you know, uh, and um, the events that occur when millennial events occur. So, you know, the end of the Dasatir is really all about, um, you know, this, this sort of, you know, okay, the Arabs are coming, it's the end of millennium, but in thousand years again, you know, in the next great cycle, uh, the, you know, Persian rule will be restored. So it's, you know, I don't think it's at all coincidental that uh, these texts sort of proliferate at the time of the Islamic millennium, right? I mean, that this text is basically exactly contemporary with the moment of the Islamic millennium and, and it's something I've argued elsewhere is patronized by, um, by Akbar. But uh, in terms of the circulation of the Dasat here, I actually don't think it, I've never seen a manuscript copy that circulated among Zoroastrians before Mola Firuz, right? All the manuscripts are, are Muslim as far as I can tell. Um, so I, I actually think that the, you know, the, the sort of mainstream Orthodox or whatever Zoroastrian reception of the text is relatively late, although I think that they do find, um, you know, some, um, you know, real, uh, you know, sympathetic material there um, with, with some other sort of currents in, in, in sort of modern Zoroastrian thought. Um, Looking, I have these questions which I want to uh, bring in here, but just along those lines, that it, it makes me think of the just how you highlighted the universality of, in the in the, of languages that's going on very explicitly in the British Library uh, manuscript, yeah. um, and that it, that there's a, a an element of uh, of trying to you know encyclopedic and uh, inter maybe not uh, multilingual certainly uh, and and universal as you you know it and. It reminded me of the a similar kind of work uh, uh, when we get into these grimoires um, of like uh, uh, very explicitly in in Sakha, that Emily Sealove is working on. And I'm, I know you're you're familiar with it with Sakaki Shamo that has Sanskrit, it has Hebrew, it has. Um, I mean, in the title, Shamil is like the the modern yeah. the, another way of talking about encyclopedism in in a very you know explicit sense. And the the these words so is, is the Arabic and Persian and uh, of course and uh, Sanskrit and Hebrew and Aramaic, um, and and it is trying to bring in all all so there's a, you know all of these different uh, occult practices of 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 summoning and controlling forces, both astral and demonic, uh, and maybe these things can intersect um, and angelic and angelic. And I was curious about the. Um, you know how this fits into a long continuum of of the universality of occult practice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's absolutely um, uh, worth underscoring here. And I think you know, it, you know, notable about Sakaki is my understanding um, is that this is also the earliest um, um, uh, textual evidence for the circulation of sort of these you know prayers themselves, right? So there, there's a sort of direct link between you know the prayers that are in Waradatu Taktisat in the Dasatir and also in, in Shamal. So I mean, it's all linked up somehow. Um, I, you know, other than uh, the sort of universality of the occult practice, you know, it's really difficult to write a history of universalism or universality oh. or perennialism because, you know, the very category defies historicization. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, other than, than, than simply saying, you know, this is um, undoubtedly, I think, in some way or another, you know, to be connected, uh, uh, to, to move beyond that to something, mm. you know, um, linear, you know, in a world that's not linear, <laughs> it's certainly not thinking linearly, where you go from Sohra Vardhi to, you know, and a sort of ideal world, you'd have a direct line from Sohra Vardhi to Sakaki to Plefo to Azar Kevon, you know, or something like that. And I think, um, and I think that, that, you know, that kind of direct transmission, which philologists so often want is really difficult to, um, to, uh, to lay a finger on. Yeah, I mean, it resists it, right? It's like yeah. part of its currency is is precisely like you said the the ubiquity of it, and that it isn't. Um, I mean, and I think that's a, the 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 very value of the pseudo epigraphic in a sense that it is perennial and uh, and ancient. And um, it, I mean, it, I, I I could just go on with you, and it, this maybe it's a very niche uh, set of conversations and questions. There are um, a series of questions on on the side here 
Um, what, but one thing just uh, I wanted to kind of pivot here before jumping into those questions was the issue of intelligibility uh, mm -hmm. that came to mind, and then I'll let it go. Uh, sure. And that may be more broad uh, and, and, and certainly speaks to the philological expertise that you're bringing to bear and the ways in which we can imagine the purposes and uses of philology in, 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 in this modern context, this kind of post Orientalist context. Um, that there is a, I mean, it, was, it, it must have been excruciating to work through these, some of these passages because of we're dealing, certainly when you're looking at the sense. Sanskrit and, and you, you mentioned even the Turkish elements are just garbled, but um, about how intelligible these were, these, you know, what is at stake in, in a, um, the, the so-called nomina barbara that we have throughout like antiquity and into, yeah. into these works and into there being a kind of liturgical otherness um, that resists translation in some sense. I'd, lo I'd love to hear you at a kind of macro level about that. Yeah, I mean, that, that, I think that that's a, a super important question. I guess one thing I would say is that like, you know, I imagine that the early readers of the text had some sort of key, right? That they that, that they must have. Otherwise, it would have been impossible for them to write the marginal commentaries in which you have the exact corresponding word from Sohrabardi, yeah. you know, glossing the Persian word, right? So, so there must have been, you know, some sort of of, of um, uh, uh, tool which which um, individuals had access to that would allow them uh, to to sort of get at the at least the, the meanings of the pure Persian words. I think I think you're absolutely right though that you know I think there's there's a notion that runs throughout this literature of God's speech as other, right? That God doesn't speak in, in the same way that humans do. Um, he doesn't have he doesn't have you know speech organs. He communicates simply by transferring meaning onto the heart. And so I think um, you know one finds these kinds of as you say nomina barbara or you know you know uh, sort of automatic language kinds of texts as they're sometimes called in the later periods. Uh, in various traditions, right? You know, the, we have these 19th century ex examples of like the language of Mars, where where you know wafts or something um, is is uh, you know communicating in this, but but seems to everyone to be simply gibberish, but but which has this kind of occult um, yeah um, aspect to it. I, I mean, this actually br brings right into um, Alexander Jabari's uh, question. I don't know if you're able to see it in the yeah I, I can see it, yeah, uh, which which pulls up the, the, the issue of of the philological. Uh, could you comment on its relationship to philological projects that were contemporary or preceded it? Um, which is fascinating, like that we move right into dictionaries too, right? That you, you yeah. talked about the Borhane um, yeah. uh, And then also, also along these lines, the poetic, uh, just uh, uh, to gloss to it. And then as you illuminated for us, its philosophical context is not ex nihilo, but uh, translates earlier Arabic works. Might its uh, linguistics innovation similar to be building on or translating earlier works? I, I, yeah. Feel yeah. No. No. That's a terrific uh, question. Hi, hi, Alex. Uh, for, for and thanks for asking this. I mean, I think um, that uh, you know, at the I guess starting from the contemporary moment, maybe trying to work a little bit backwards. Um, we know, you know, for instance. In fact, this is, I guess, even later than the Dasot here, but we know um, a little bit about the historical circumstances of the life of Mubad, the author of the Davistan, uh, who also uh, could compose texts in pure Persian. We actually have letters uh, that are extant uh, from the Qutb Shahi court in Hyderabad, uh, or you know, near Hyderabad in Golconda, um, which, uh, which describe uh, Mubad's um, arrival at the court, um, his um, sort of uh, upstanding character as a, as a, you know, sort of human being, as a sort of mystic uh, who, whose testimony is worth that of many men in court, but also of his linguistic abilities that he is able to uh, write the most amazing texts uh, in, in pure Persian. Uh, so we know Mubad was actually literally at the Qutb Shahi court at the same side, same time that Borhan was writing Borhan Ekate, and so he no doubt was the sort of direct link um, between the Dasotir and Borhan Ekote. But if we think about earlier uh, materials, um, the Sharistan Charchaman, an earlier work from the Azar Kevani school, uh, discusses the composition of the Fat Hangi Jahangiri, mm -hmm. another uh, sort of encyclopedic dictionary project which, be, which preceded the Borhan Ekote and which was yeah. begun <clears throat> under the Mughal Emperor Akbar, finished by uh, Jahangir. Um, there's, there's a debate in Iran, apparently, about the, the, the sort of relative status of different languages as uh, it comes up in the Borhan Eklate, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. in which, uh, you know, it's a series of, it's a group of students who are debating whether Arabic is better than Persian or not. 
uh, and and they come to the the argument that Arabic has more phonemes than Persian does, and therefore it's superior. And then the Azar Kevani guy says, "Well, if that's your argument, then Tibetan's the best language in the world because it's got the most phonemes." <laughs> um, but uh, but one thing that the Farhangi Jahangiri does also is that Akbar was also interested in incorporating ancient Persian vocabulary into the text and actually brought a Zoroastrian priest uh, from Iran to India to the court. Uh, to uh, to assist uh, um, Inju in in um, in adding uh, Middle Persian words to the dictionary, uh, Pahlavi words, what are sometimes called Huzvaresh or um, Arameograms in Pahlavi into Fahangajongiri. So there's clearly a lexicographical interest in the antiquity of the Persian language, and in trying, you know, from various sources to uh, to document, um, you know, not just the Persian that is you know current, but also the Persian. Um, in, in, in its sort of most, uh, you know, ancient and most sort of obscure forms. I'll just leave it at that for now. Yeah. No, I, the, I, I, Inju's work is just so fascinating. Uh, the, the, um, and it's, 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 I'm delighted to hear of this line. Uh, it kind of gives a whole new context to it for me. So thank you. I'm, I, I wasn't aware of the, the, the way in which it was produced. Um, in both Akbar and Jahangir's period. Uh, I, I, there's this other question about the uh, here by um, Mariano about the connections with the Dasatir and Shi groups in the Persian sphere in the 19th century. Um, yeah, I mean, is there a sectarian flair to the way this this text circulates, or does it? I mean, clearly, if uh, yeah, uh, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, in the 19th century, I think that it certainly does circulate primarily among Shi'is. So. Um, Thinking about uh, Ruswa himself, um, uh, who is uh, Shi'i from Lucknow, the one who translated the Dasotir for the for the journal in Osceola, um, uh, you know, as being one example of this. But um, another, you know, sort of really uh, strange example of the Dasotir showing up in the 19th century is um, in the Aga Khan case hmm. uh, to do with whether the Satpanthis of Western India. Uh, the Koja Satpanthis of Western India are in fact uh, Ismaili uh, and in fact the uh, you know, devotees of the Aga Khan, uh, a, a, a matter which caused considerable debate in the 19th century, ultimately caused schism within the Koja community uh, in, in multiple ways, um, but uh, went to court in British India. And, and at one point, um, a, a lawyer trying to argue that uh, the Kojas were not Ismaili um, uh, adduced uh, as evidence a text that he couldn't quite figure out. He, he knew that the Kojas, he was a British lawyer, he knew the Kojas had a text called Das Avatar, the 10 avatars, presumably of Ram, um, but it's, you know, it's a Koja devotional text. When, um, and um, uh, instead of producing the Das Avatar, which is a text in, in, in um, Kojki, Gujarati, and Sindhi, uh, instead he produced the Dasotir in court. Uh, and then uh, you know, claimed that the Kojas actually believed in the Dasotir. And then he ended up undermining his own argument because the Dasatir, you know, because of this like Iranian Islam thing kind of looks like Ismailism. Um, uh, they ended up arguing that, uh, in fact, the Dasatir supported the argument that the Kojas were somehow the, de the devotees of the Aga Khan. Uh, Tina Parohit talks about this in her book on the Aga Khan case for anyone who's interested. So, uh, you know, it's a great question. I think that, you know, in terms of loci of transmission, most of the manuscripts of the Dasatir seem to have been written primarily, you know, in sort of, you know, Hyderabad or Lucknow area, sort of traditional centers of Shi'is um, within India. Um, it's, the text obviously also was in Iran, although I don't really know much about the, the manuscript history of the text there because most of the copies are much later. Um, but um, yeah, that, that'll be my answer for now. I mean, it, it does it does kind of pick up with uh, Mariano's earlier question or later question uh, as well as like intersections with early Kulat. That maybe brings us yeah. back to the problem of Iranian Islam. Um, Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, there's a very uh, I mean tech, specific, kind of simple question perhaps. Um, where would a student access the Dasatir along with the Vesan text within it? What was the this is Zal here? What was the name of the text which had the Dasatir along with the Vesan text within it? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Zal. Thanks for coming to this talk, by the way. Um, um, but uh, uh, the Dasotir, I mean, was published, you know, first in 1818 by Mola Firuz. You can get it on, on Google Books. Uh, you know, I think that's pretty much how anyone gets it these days. They're on archive.org. Um, but, uh, you know, it doesn't include the Avestan texts um, in, in it because Mola Firuz's manuscript didn't have them. But uh, the, the manuscript of the British Library that I showed does. Uh, 
and that of Western texts is, is um, you know, it's it's corset uh, uh, It's in any corte of Esta, right? So um, if you have a, a you know essentially a Zoroastrian prayer book with you, uh, you know it's 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 the first uh, of the neoyish and, and the neoyish in the corte of Esta. Uh, and so the corte of Esta texts some um, have been translated. I think most um, you know widely circulating is the translation of Kanga, uh, especially among Zoroastrians. That one's been re reprinted many times. Um, but uh, uh, but it's you know available in translation elsewhere to avesta.org of course has it as well. So yeah. uh, thank you. That, uh, uh, and, and this is just from Matt Mel Melvin Kushki here, and and maybe this we can be our last uh, our last question. Um, brilliant as always, which I just want to underscore as well. This was uh, superlative and uh, formidable, so I really appreciate it, Dan. Um, but is there any hint uh, in the reception of the uh, uh, history of the Dasatir of technically, of, of course, uh, Matt would be interested in letterist readings of, of, uh, of any of the pure Persian, uh, quote unquote, gibberish specifically, or more explicit theory as to its effectiveness, um, you know, as uh, in, its, in its letterist form. So here, mm -hmm. a Rufi or something to that effect, yeah. Yeah, no, of course, you know, thanks, Matt, uh, as always. <laughs> and uh, we're very much looking forward to your talk in a few hours. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a tradition, tr a terrific question. Um, th as far as I can tell, um, there is no um, technical letterism, you know, um, although I've always suspected, right, that that, that, that is there somewhere, um, you know, not just in the, in the text of the Dasotir itself. I've tried to, you know, add up the numerical values of various letters to see if anything can sort of come up. I've always wanted to, you know, uh, find an example of a, a place in which the numerical value of Zohar is Arabic and, you know, the, the language of heaven might somehow match or something like that, but I've never found it. Uh, and that sort of gets to this bigger question of like the place of magic within the Dasotir. I mean, on the one hand, we, 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 we think of these texts as being occult texts, you know, they, they're, they're associated with the practice of theurgy um, uh, and, uh, and planetary magic. Um, but you know, within the Dasatir itself, and even within the hagiographical literature, it doesn't really, you know, seem to um, uh, to indicate that these were really understood to be, you know, like effective at anything other than purifying the soul, right? Mm. Uh, you know, th this is essentially like the practice of the philosopher uh, who at attempts to attain theosis rather than the sort of, uh, you know, court magician who can be, you know, effective in obtaining victory in battle, right? Um, you know, th there is no sort of indication that this is what you recite when you want, you know, it, the weather to be sunny, or this is what you recite when there's famine or disease, or this is what you recite when you're going into battle. Rather, it's, it's all, you know, very internal um, uh, and, um, and aimed at, um, you know, allowing uh, the, the saint to you know, be able to leave the body behind, to leave the ego behind, uh, and and obtain um, uh, you know communion essentially or oneness uh, with with the divine entity. So I'll yeah, just leave it at that. Well, Dan, I could just follow up with millions of questions here that, that come to mind. I'm I'm you know interested in uh, the the element of uh, riyazi riyazat that you highlight and along those lines um, that that's put into the. Uh, the Dabastan as a description in the uh, the the, the bio biographical uh, entry on Azar Kaiban, um, and uh, you know this as part of a spiritual form of practice or, or discipline and discourses around perfect nature. I'm thinking of Michael Noble's work um, and and planetary evocations and how perfect nature might fit into that as well. But um, we could continue talking. I know that we need to also draw this to to a close. It's been such a treat to catch up and hear this amazing work that you're doing, just one of many facets of a broad portfolio of of topics and, and, and subjects that you are uh, exploring. And I wanna thank you so much for uh, opening up our, our series. This is just such a, a wonderful, delightful conversation to have had. Uh, I also wanna give a shout out for uh, uh, next their next meeting will be uh, joined by uh, Arya Fani from the University of Washington. He'll be speaking about what does translation mean in the age of colonial modernity. That's on Wednesday, October 6th. So that's when we'll convene again as uh, for the Iran Colloquium at 12 p.m. on Wednesday, October 6th. And again, Dan, Professor Sheffield, uh, what an honor. Um, and I, I just so appreciate you joining in uh, today with us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Travis and uh, Marwa and Marjan uh, all. It's been such a pleasure. Cheers. Yeah, be well, everyone. <laughs>